So as next speaker, we have Dr. Brian Wishart uh, here uh, from MGH. He's going to be speaking on symptomatic therapy and rehabilitation. Thanks so much, Brian. Thank you. Good morning. So I think I am what's in the way of lunch, and I'll try to be quick and brief and get you guys there. Um, when I was originally asked to do this, it was on kind of gait analysis, Botox, tone management, and then when it got put on the list, it said symptom management, and I felt a little overwhelmed when I started doing it, and then realized that there were other people talking about many different symptoms. So we are not talking about general all symptoms. We're going to kind of focus a little bit. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, we'll, we'll try to go over some of the typical gait changes we see kind of across the board in both women, men, <clears throat> as well as some of our children with cerebral ALD and what, what we often see in terms of their, their dysfunctions in terms of gait. Um, we'll talk about what's causing those and what we can do to affect them in terms of our tone management. And then if there's weakness or there's other issues, what we can do in terms of bracing. And finally, we'll just touch on some of the equipment considerations that are out there because um, that's a huge topic if we wanted to. So as you guys have been hearing, there's lots of symptoms that get um, addressed or, or get affected within this, this whole um, disease. And we're going to really focus on gait in particular. We're going to look at what's causing problems with the gait, so the spasticity, dystonia in some respects. Um, I apologize, I did not check the female dystonia because I had put head to debation and voice changes elsewhere, but I, I will change that for future. Um, slides. Um, but really spasticity, weakness, um, impaired balance, these are the things that really affect our gait and what can we do to, to, to improve those and, and, and change them. So to get to that, we really should talk about normal walking. When we talk about walking, it's, it's a complex thing. It takes a long time for us to, to learn how to walk, right? We're, we're not even doing any of it until we're about a year old. It takes until we're three to develop kind of mature gait patterns, and then it's not until we're seven until we really have a mature temporal, we're taking the same kind of amount of steps, the same speed, the same lengths. So it takes us a long time compared to everything else we do to do a good job, and that's because there's a lot of coordination that goes into it between the neurologic system, the musculoskeletal system, and all the things involved there. Um, but the goal is to move really our trunk and our head smoothly forward in, in a horizontal fashion with vertical motions. Most of what we're doing is lifting our feet up and down and we need to move forward without kind of bouncing our eyes around so we can keep oriented. There's a couple things that are prerequisites in order to have a good balance and I have them listed here sort of in order of priority. So the main thing is we need to be stable. We need to be able to take our foot off the ground and move it forward and not fall over and so that's a kind of the main thing that that we need to be and you can see when we look let's see, over here a good portion, so from 10% to 50%, and this is sort of our stance phase of our right leg here, is 40% of that is on one leg typically. So most of the time we're, we're walking, 80% of our walk is on one leg. And so that does challenge our balance system, it challenges our strength. Um, and then we also need to move forward. So the rest of the part is the limb advancement, moving that foot forward and clearing it from the ground, right? So if we were to just stand stable, both of our feet are on the ground. When we're standing stable, it's not like we're coming up real high because that's not very energy efficient. We need to figure out mechanisms in order to get our foot forward without tripping. <clears throat> Once we do that, we need to make sure that foot's in a good position and, and we're taking an adequate step length to make sure that we're moving forward in a, in a reasonable manner. And then energy conservation is kind of the name of the game after all of this happens. So we want to make sure we're moving forward in, a, in an energy efficient manner. If we're taking way too much effort in order to get our foot forward, to keep ourselves stable, we're going to change what we're doing and we're not going to continue to do that. So these are sort of the steps that we need to take and this is what's getting affected when we have issues with our muscles and our neurologic control of, of those muscles. Um, yeah, let's see, I don't think, oh, this does work. So what do we see in AMN, in female AMN, and early AMN as it progresses? Um, it can be very subtle initially. It can come with kind of very minor changes and that's due to the different things that are being affected. So our cortical spinal tracts are being affected, it changes how much control we have over our muscles, how much um, insight we have into where our joints are in space and what our balance looks like. And so what you can see here is just kind of starting at the top, it does kind of look like there's a little bit maybe more motion in the arms but if you look at the proximal arms and particularly um, that right one, there's actually a little bit decreased arm swing. So they're kind of up 
and out and keeping ourselves in a stable position. So if you look, watch children as they're learning to walk, right, when, they have, when they're toddlers and they're just falling all over the place, their arms are out like this the whole time they're walking, getting ready for a fall. And you can see that early on. As people start to feel more uncomfortable with their gait, they're going to start preparing themselves for balance and to fall and to grab onto something if something is happening. There's also a little bit of decreased strength and decreased coordination in terms of our, our muscles. So in order to advance that limb, typically we're having a good push off from our, our calf muscles. We're pulling forward with our hip musculature. And you can see that, that there's some compensation happening early on. And so we're getting some increased pelvic rotation. So we're coming through and using the rest of our whole body in order to advance our leg, which really is not all that energy efficient. And then additionally, we start having some decreased control over our muscles. So we see some scissoring as she's coming across. And during that swing phase, our adductors are activating. We're coming kind of more narrow. And so our gait, our, our stance becomes almost a little bit more narrow. You can see that sort of towards the end of each step, they're coming forward a little bit. So as we progress, things get a little bit worse and our muscles and everything kind of changes a bit more. And so what you see is you see a little bit of anterior pelvic tilt that probably comes with a lot. There's a lot of things that are contributing to that, including some tightness within our hip flexors. We're getting a little bit of um, tight hip flexors, tighter back muscles. Um, you can also see that with um, what was the some decreased balance. You'll see the shortened stride length, so we're not taking as long as steps. We're not having a good heel strike at initial contact. You can see he's landing sort of midfoot as he's coming through, and so that's going to decrease our our stride length is going to decrease our walking speed and efficiency. Additionally, has some scissoring, but also it's kind of a complex swing phase because as you see initially, he, particularly on that left, you can see it, he has to come out a little bit, and that's called circumduction, and that's going to help us sort of clear that foot. So if we're not able to come straight through because our toe is down, we'll come around in order to do that. But then it's still even coming past almost that midline as he's stepping forward, and that's some activation of those adductors. And then additionally, there's this mild Trendelenburg. So if you watch his head as he's walking, he's kind of bobbling back and forth, right? And so when we step up, our glute muscles on the side, our butt muscles over here, are going to activate to keep our pelvis steady and keep us from falling over, right? So if we're on this side, it kind of goes this way. And so those are weak, and he doesn't have great control. So every time he steps up on that leg, he kind of comes this way and back and forth. And that can put a lot of strain on our hips, on our lower back. Um, and can lead to issues down the road. And then finally, we have some decreased knee extension, some decreased hip extension, and all that comes with increased muscle spasticity and tone, and it's going to decrease our efficiency. It's going to decrease our ability to move forward quickly. Um, so for some of our more... Walk? No. Please. So this is an example, and I, and I will say this is not a um, ALD patient. This is a spastic quadriplegic. I don't think that one's in play. No? Oh. It's weird. <laughs> okay, they all came from the same spot. But so what we end up seeing in some of these boys is we see um, plantar flexion. So increased plantar flexion as they're coming down, which comes from hyper um, tonicity and spasticity of our calf muscles. That has kind of undue effects, and we'll talk about the importance of the ankle and, and all of those muscles a little bit later. But it has effects all the way up in our gait. So you can imagine once we step down, if we're unable to push our foot down, what ends up happening is it pushes our shin back. And so that pushes our knees into hyperextension, which can be bad for our bones and our, and our, our, our knee joints and health. In order to kind of clear our, fit, our foot, we're going to have to circumduct all the way around for similar reasons. Um, we're a little unstable, right? So being all the way up changes our, our dynamics, and so you get decreased stability on that stance leg, which in turn shortens our stride length, and so they're not going to take as long as steps and, and instability in that stance. So, and then finally, you know, towards non-ambulatory phase, and this is a man with um, advanced AMN um, that Dr. Eichler met, I think, in France, um, and what you can see in the CD position, and this happens to everybody, this is not, this, this, um, diagram on the bottom left there is not a specific to AMN concern. This happens to all of us because we all sit too much. We're all on the computer too much and we kind of sit like this and hunch over. And what you see is, is this different patterns of muscul muscles. So on the left you can see it says inhibited, which would be also known as weak versus facilitated or tight. And we often see 
tight kind of anterior structures. So our, our pec minors get tight. We roll our shoulders forward. We get weak in our, our scapular stabil stabilizers. So we're not kind of coming back in good posture and we come forward like this. Our neck, we get kind of tight in those deep flexion and are weak in those deep, fle deep flexion and tighten the posterior neck. And we kind of sit with this anterior head carriage. Um, which can set us up for poor mechanics, it can set us up for pain, and you can see that up on the top um, really well, and even a little bit when he's standing. And then in the lower extremities, you can see that kind of weak glutes, tight hip flexors that kind of come here, and then you get tight low back and weak core that puts us into this position. And again, that changes our mechanics, it sets us up for um, pain and, and other issues. Standing is a great way to sort of relieve all of this so we we want all of our patients to be standing as much as possible even if they're not ambulating and you can see that in his face as he comes up we're stretching out those hip flexors those hamstrings we're opening up that back and that chest and and moving forward with it so what do we do and, and how do we address it um, tone management is what i'm going to focus most of the next part on um, the things that we really want to address are spasticity it's kind of an abnormal stretch reflex, so when we check our reflexes, it, it hits a tendon, a Golgi tendon, that um, uh, looks at where, where our muscles are in space and how much they're being stretched, and then we lose our inhibition to that, and so it produces this abnormal loop. And so addressing that and changing that spasticity is important. We can also see clonus, which is that bouncing that often we see in the ankles. You can see it in other muscles as well. Um, and then you can get co-contraction, which I think is an important thing to talk about. So we need this selective motor control when we're, when we're walking. We need to be able to control one muscle and not the other one. We need to make sure that if we activate our, our biceps, our triceps doesn't activate at the same time. And that's something that comes with the development of the neuro neurologic system, but can also go awry when we start having issues. So just to kind of talk about the gait disturbances a little bit, on the left we look at what the what muscles are being activated. So that dotted line is this switch from stance phase to swing phase. And the thing that I wanna emphasize here is this says ankle, knee, and hip. And you can see that really the majority of the muscles that are controlling our walking are our ankle muscles. Most of what we do in terms of maintaining stability, maintaining where we are, it comes from our ankle. We ideally are not using those big muscles. It's not efficient, it's not a quick, an, an easy way to keep uh, ourselves balanced. And this little gremlin is something that I learned early on when I was learning about gait, and it's kind of stuck with me. And you can see that he's really focusing on two muscles, our calf muscles and the, sh and the shin muscle, the tibialis anterior. And it, with that, you're able to sort of balance where you are in space and where um, this ground re reaction force that we talk about. So every force has an equal and opposite react force. When we step down on the ground, the ground pushes back on us, and that kind of helps us balance where we are and what our joints are doing. And so... Thinking about this little guy and the fact that the ankle is the most important thing, we can then kind of figure out what we need to do moving forward. And so we do a lot, we can do a lot of things, including these gait analysis studies, which are often very in depth and we get these crazy little stick figure pictures. But this is that, that ground reaction force and it comes from wherever our kind of main point of contact is on the ground up to our center of mass. And the important part here that I just want to emphasize is so you can see here at the ankle, it's kind of going anterior to the ankle. And if it's too far anterior, depending on how far anterior, there's going to be a force trying to close that joint in that direction. So it would be trying to dorsiflex or bring that shin, shin over the, the foot. It's coming kind of neutral to the knee, but if it was too far behind the knee, it would try to close that knee and, and, and bring you down. And so if we are not having good control of that, or our ankles and our knees and everything is not where we want due to spasticity or, or um, contractures, it can really make our gait inefficient and challenging. Um, so what we see often, and this is, um, I think, from a spastic gait, but we often see, it's one of the more common gait patterns I've been seeing in clinic, is this is the tibialis anterior, and this is an EMG finding of, of when somebody's walking. So this pattern here is what it's supposed to be doing. And you can see it's pretty on. So during swing phase, that tibialis anterior fires, it gets, gets us to clear our foot, it fires a little bit once we go into stance to ease it down onto the ground, and then it's off as we go through. Our gastroc and our soleus, those are both our, part of our calf muscles, are supposed to really be firing during our stance phase. As we start to push off, that's where we get most of our power from our walking. But what you can see is we're losing some of our selective motor control. And so 
While it's supposed to be just here, it continues throughout the entire gait cycle. So you can imagine during that swing phase when we're supposed to be firing our tibialis anterior, all of our calf muscles, which are made to lift our body over and over and over again and are very strong, are going to overpower that tibialis anterior and it's going to increase our, our leg length, it's going to make clearance difficult, and it's going to have you know, falling risks and other issues in terms of our gait. So, what can we do? I talk about tone management in sort of a spectrum, right? So we want to really focus here. This is our, our bread and butter. This is what we, we use, we should be using every day. Stretching, bracing, therapy. This is what's going to keep us moving forward and make sure that we're able to continue and, and, and do what we're doing. Everything that we're doing over here is just to augment our, our therapy programs, our stretching programs, and any bracing that we're doing. The bracing can be for multiple reasons, whether it's to make up for weakness or if it's to help with positioning and to kind of increase the amount of stretching. You can imagine if you stretch for three times a day, 10 minutes each time, that's a pretty good stretching regimen. If we put a nighttime stretching brace on and you wear it for eight hours, that's eight times what you were doing elsewhere. So, so this is our basis and this is the most important. Physical therapy, really, when we start talking about the lower extremities and gait, if we have issues in our upper extremities, we can talk about occupational therapy. Aquatic therapy is wonderful and, and something that we use pretty frequently because it takes out gravity, it takes out that hard endpoint often. Hippotherapy is something that I use very often in children and I think would be wonderful in this population. It does a great job at adductors and stretching them out. It also helps with kind of core balance. Um, okay, and so the times that we start kind of moving away from here is when we're not tolerating our stretching regimen. We're having difficulty, you know, tolerating getting through our therapy program or we're not able to get on our braces. And so we'll start talking about some of our medications. Oral medications all come with some concerns. The times we'd want to use it is if it's really global tone and we have it in multiple areas. It's in multiple limbs, both legs, lots of muscles. And the problem with it, and there's sort of a list of some of them here, almost all of them except for really one act centrally. And so they all come with sedating effects. They all come with side effects. Um, but they can do a good job. Baclofen is often a, an early one that we would use on a, on a regular basis. There's other ones that we can use as needed. Um, but typically, if we're starting to move to medications, we want to take this on, a, on an ongoing basis. If it's more of a, a few muscles that we're worried about, that's when we start talking about focal tone management. And, and that would be botulinum toxin. There's a couple different renditions of it, whether it's Botox or Dysport. They've now been approved for children as well. Um, and the nice part about this is that one, it's semi-permanent, it, it goes in, it does permanently end the transmission of the neurotransmitter over, but the body replaces that, and then you're able to kind of go forward. So if you do a little bit too much or you pick the wrong muscle, that will wear off, and, and the weakness that comes with it will go away. Um, the things that, that we worry about and that I've noticed is that underlying spasticity always, there is weakness. And so when we give Botox and we take away that spasticity, you're going to get weak from it. And often spasticity is much more complicated than it's there, we should treat it. It, it makes up for a lot of things that we're not doing with our muscles when we're, when we're um, weak. And so, you know, you may be very weak in a leg, but that spasticity is giving you stability there. And so now you're able to at least stand on it and advance that, that other limb. And so this is where tone management gets a little bit more complicated than just, I have tone, we should get rid of it. And when we have start having discussions about it. If these things aren't working, and I, and I will say I haven't seen many patients in this um, realm that have had to move forward to the kind of the surgical aspect of it, there, but there are options. So intrathecal baclofen pumps are a great option. We see them a lot in patients with MS. The beauty of that is that the baclofen, which can be sedating, gets direct, directly um, administered to the intrathecal space around the spinal cord. So you can use multitudes lower dosing, so micrograms and, as opposed to milligrams. Um, and so you lose a lot of those sedating effects and you can do it on an ongoing basis. So you're not worrying about trying to dose it in terms of here's our peak and then it comes down, but it gets up and you get a steady state and you're able to sort of manage that tone much more uh, steadily. There's also other procedures including selective dorsal rhizotomies where they clip some of the nerves and, and other orthopedic surgeries such as tendon lengthening that I haven't seen and I don't know how um, useful it would be in this population. But there are a lot of options in terms of tone management. Um, the next step would be bracing. Bracing is used for multiple things. It's, it, you know, the idea behind bracing is really to um, make up for either weakness, instability, 
kind of accommodate for different deformities or try to correct some of those, those deformities. If we're, we're trying to put it back in a different place, if we feel like we can't do that, we can try to accommodate for it. So if we have a plantar flexion contracture and we're unable with tone management and everything else to get that heel down, we can put in a shoe lift and try to get you down. So at least you have a good, a good purchase on the ground and you're making full contact. There's lots of different types and all of them have sort of different reasons for, for moving forward with them. Um, this, um, this one up here is a double upright. It was kind of the old classic form, but we still do use it occasionally, particularly in some of our older folks that have heart conditions and a lot of swelling in their lower extremities where you might not be able to put a full contact brace on that's gonna be right along the skin because that skin is moving where it is from time to time. Um, and so this is a great option. Between these and, and our articulated braces, which um, I think are here, um, you, can, you can accommodate for some weakness, right? So you can give a dorsiflexion assist that gives a little bit of push off as we're going through. Um, you can give a little plantar flexion assist and you can help with some of the weakness that we see in some of these muscles. If we have more instability in terms of kind of medial lateral, you can not necessarily have to come all the way up and talk about sort of a super malleolar AFO that really helps control this way, but doesn't do much in terms of moving forward and back. And then there's other ones such as this ground reaction force that if we have a lot of weakness in our, in a, in our um, quads, that'll kind of push our knee back. It was originally made for polio. Um, but there's lots of different options and something that really should be um, talked about. I, I struggle sometimes doing this on my own. I, I have an orthotist in one of my clinics with a physical therapist. And this can be a long discussion as to, in terms of finding the correct brace for the for the right person. Um, but the goal is really to improve your alignment, improve your efficiency, and, and make sure that we're, we're moving as best we can. And then finally, um, equipment. There's a lot of equipment out there. There's a lot of options. And I think it's one of the things that I've seen has been a little bit overlooked in this population, particularly our, our females with AMN. You know, we're having issues with our ADLs. We're having issues getting around. I see a lot of transport chairs um, that kind of fold up, and they're great because they're easy. They get put into the back of the car, and they're not too um, challenging to move around. But there's, there's a lot of different options out there from manual chairs to manual assist um, to full power chairs if needed that can really help kind of manage a lot of these symptoms and help us get our mobility and our independence back and be able to go do the things we want to do without having to feel limited by whatever that is. Um, you know, at home, bath chairs, commodes are, are all very important in terms of kind of lesser mobility from the wheelchairs. There's lots of different options from these, you know, the rollators to standard walkers to our loft strand or forearm crutches that um, I'm a, a huge uh, proponent of. We see them a lot more in Europe, actually, even for just like fractures here, we, we often default to the axillary crutches, but those loft strain crutches kind of clip onto the forearm so it frees up your hands um, and does a great job. Um, medical car seats, I think, are an important um, topic, especially for some of our younger boys that are being affected as we move forward. We want to make sure that we're, we're providing a safe manner of transport for these children and not just kind of squeezing them in into a seat that may not fit or they're, they're too big for. And then seating, you know, this is another aspect in terms of standards, I think, as well as our seating for um, some of the boys and even for, for some of our older patients that, you know, making sure we're in the correct position when we're sitting. It's going to make a huge difference in terms of our work, in terms of our ability to maintain and, and focus um, and, and open up. You know, I, I see kids that are really affected and in chairs, and once we kind of stand them up and get that back up and get those hips open, their whole personality changes, it increases their, their self-esteem, and they just, they're, they're like a different person. So I think just making sure we, we take a full look at what our needs are, um, and then have a, a nice discussion about what, what we can do for them is important. So it's kind of a quick, brief run over everything um, that's there. Hopefully you don't look like my four-year-old on her birthday. <laughs> she just collapsed. But, um, any questions? So I'm an unlikely uh, fitness guru, but um, exercise is something that I'm very passionate about. And, um, 
I think the, the, uh, the lesson for me has been uh, frequency, uh, creativity, uh, social support, and variety. And uh, I think the, uh, the key thing is to move almost every day. And you have to move safely because obviously we have to be uh, aware of the risk of falls. And uh, if you fall and break something, uh, the, uh, it's going to be very hard to get back to baseline. And so you want to avoid falling in your activities of daily living and of course when you exercise. Uh, but you have to move every day or you know, ideally five or six times a week. Uh, I find that when I don't move, I get very stiff, I get very spastic, uh, I don't sleep well, and I'm physically and psychologically less well than uh, if I've moved for even half an hour uh, that day. I, I think uh, uh, creativity, uh, so basically, you know, uh, like many of the men um, who spoke yesterday, I used to be a tennis player, a skier, a backpacker, and that's gone. And so I think you have to look at other things to do. Um, one enigma for me is how many people with a disability uh, don't know about Pilates, which I think is extraordinary. The reformer flow is amazing for flexibility, for balance, for core strength, and for well-being. Uh, there are also uh, special uh, yoga classes like yin yang yoga, which is different from the vigorous vinyasa flow. It's uh, much safer, it's much more mindful.